Hello, and welcome to the second in our series of IST PhD events. I'm Brenda Dermody. I'm a designer, researcher, author, and educator based at TU Dublin. I'm also the Ireland coordinator of the ISTD Student Assessment Scheme, the Deputy Head of Education, and a Fellow of ISTD. In this series of live events, we aim to gain insight from practitioners and academics through focusing on their doctoral research in the areas of typography and graphic design. And tonight we are delighted to welcome Justin Burns. Before I introduce Justin, we have some notices. Uh, the International Society of Typographic Designers is a professional body run by and for typographers, graphic designers and educators. The society has an international membership who share and support its aim to create and inspire interest in all forms of typographic practice. Justin will speak for approximately 30 minutes. We will take your questions via the chat window on the ISTD live page and try to answer them all at the end. Unless you register, the chat is anonymous, so please include your name and location at the beginning of your question so we can get a sense of who and where we all are. I'd like to offer sincere thanks to Tony Pritchard, Belinda McGee, Brian Palmer, David Coates and Sabina Muller who have helped to make this evening happen. And so to our speaker. Justin Burns is the Head of Art and Design at Leeds Beckett University with courses in graphic design, illustration, fashion, fine art and product design. Justin is actively engaged within national and international education networks and institutional bodies, such as the Association for Art History, the Council for Higher Education in Art and Design and the Graphic Design Educators Network. As a graphic design practitioner, Justin has worked within fields of practice, including cultural arts and tourism, experiences which feed into his current academic research. He has recently written a series of articles for iMagazine on the graphic language of the seaside. Justin is in year five of a six year part time PhD in creative practice. His research is titled Lettering and Typography at the British Seaside, a study of resort identity, development and experience. The research investigates how lettering, typography and the discipline of graphic design contribute to the development and experience of British seaside resorts. Justin will demonstrate how designers can develop their subject interest into a research field. He will talk about his engagement with PhD research, and this will also be a fun trip to the seaside for anyone interested in typography. So welcome, Justin. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you ever so much. And uh... Thanks, thanks to you and Tony for inviting me uh, to present this evening. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity to share wider, really. So thanks again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And uh, for all the work that, that's gone into the event as well, I'd like to thank all of you um, at ISTD for all the work that's gone into it. Thank you. So I'm going to be ready to share. Can you see that okay? Yep. Oh, good. Right. So, good. If everybody can hear me, then I'll, I'll, I'll begin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this evening. And as I said, it's a privilege uh, to present as part of the ISTD series on PhDs. Um, so this is the second one following um, the one in, in December. So, so again, re really pleased to be part of this series. Um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about my uh, research to date. So, as Brenda said, I'm in year five. So I'm just coming up sort of halfway through year five. So I've got about a year and a half in theory left of my PhD. Uh, so I'm going to talk about sort of the approach, um, the research and um, sort of different methodologies really uh, and, and practices and, and sort of projects that I've been involved in uh, and of course at the end I'm, I'm very happy to take questions and uh, if, if also you want to find out more afterwards I can, I can I'm very open to that as well so that's absolutely fine. Um, so first of all I thought, I thought I'd talk about some of the PhD routes that um, I've been um, open to me in my institution are hugely supportive um, of a, a very a very rich and cultivating uh, research culture at Leeds Beckett uh, and uh, as I said really supportive in in, in looking to um, develop research in our school and uh, support those that want to undertake PhDs really so there's a there's a number of options and I'm sure this is very similar a lot of different institutions 
so so the the sort of core um, options for us at Leeds Beckett are as follows. So the roots are Doctor of Philosophy, uh, PhD in Creative Practice, Professional Doctorate in Creative Arts, PhD by Existing Published Work. So they're the four options that we have. Uh, the PhD that I'm currently undertaking is a PhD in Creative Practice. So that, that means that really I, I should be able to demonstrate the creation and interpretation of new knowledge through original research or other advanced scholarship of a quality to satisfy peer review, uh, extend the discipline and merit public dissemination through exhibition, uh, publication, um, dissemination in visual means, and of course, th th theoretical. So as opposed to the um, archetypal thesis, sort of model of a PhD, which leads Beckett, and again at other institutions is around 80,000 words, because this is largely a um, visual submission of a portfolio sort of submission of work in response to a concern or problem. Uh, the expected thesis for, in support for this research is between 15 and 25,000 words, um, just to give you an idea of um, the sort of scale of the submission. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about that I hope will be useful um, is to, to look at whether the work is either practice-based research or practice-led. Um, just look at some of the distinctions between that. So Linda Candy has written extensively about this and, and I've looked to, to sort of her referencing as this is sort of one of the sort of clearer demarcations, if you like. So um, practice-based research is an original investigation undertaken in order to gain new knowledge, partly by means of practice and the outcomes of that practice. Uh, practice-led research is concerned with the nature of practice and leads to new knowledge that has operational significance for that practice. So in discussions at my university and with my supervisory team, the emphasis really be it either one of those or, you know, and certainly with, with a practice based, which I recognize that mine is, the emphasis is, is on research and practice. And, and I mentioned that because there's a lot of discussion about how to frame a practice based PhD and not solely relying on your practice if that has been, for example, created in industry and then brought, brought in. It's, it's got to be recognised that it's a research-informed practice um, with a theoretical underpinning to, to your rationale of why you think your contribution to new knowledge is, is, um, is sound. Uh, a bit about my uh, supervisory team, as I've just mentioned. So uh, the normal sort of um, support team structure is as follows. Um, uh, I have a director of study who is Professor Lisa Stansby, who's the Dean of the School, uh, the Leeds School of Arts. Uh, also, I have an external supervisor who is Professor Phil Baines. Um, so I'm very lucky that the school has supported me to have an external supervisor. Um, so more on Phil as we go along. Uh, and also I have an internal supervisor, my colleague, uh, Dr. Ian Trulove as well. Uh, so, um, so really, really good team and support. Uh, and aside from that, I also have uh, some really in, in important contributors who have who I've met along the way or been recommended to contact along the way through uh, my supervisory team, uh, particularly Phil as well, in, the, in the, obviously in the areas of typography um, and, and graphic language. Uh, so those connections are, are really important as well, and I'll talk about those as I go along. Uh, so uh, moving on to the actual research subject in question. Uh, so, so my focus is uh, graphic design at the seaside. And really this has come about because I've always had a real sort of continual interest in the relationship between graphic design, language, typography and lettering within the environment, within place, 
And I'm, I'm really interested in how the context changes depending on the placement or the conditions of that place. Um, so uh, the, the seaside um, really plays to that because it's, its conditions change, its seasons, be, it, uh, be you know, uh, through climate, but also the seasons of its um, visitor influx and how, and, and how it, uh, the cycle works of tourism. So I think that's that was really that's really interesting to me, and although I live um, just outside Ilkley, so I can um, I can see the hills of Burley Woodhead just just up the road there, and and I work in the fine city of Leeds. I'm actually from the seaside, so I'm actually from um, South Devon, um, so I'm from uh, the English Riviera. Uh, so um, so there's 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 a there's a huge connection there for me, for for, for looking at this this area. Um, so I'm going to talk about the reasons much more as we as we come through. What I thought is quite useful to show you this page is that when you start um, your PhD, um, and again, the, the timings um, are vary across across the country, really, and in, in different institutions. But uh, you 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 have to undertake what's what's called a confirmation of registration, and this is really to determine whether your uh, your study should progress. Um, and and has to have approval from a, a review panel of, of academics. Uh, so and then and then they support you on how that's going to progress to your regular annual progression meetings. Uh, again, where your work and your progress is reviewed year upon year. Okay. What I thought was useful with this is that is just on reflection, my title and how it's changed. So obviously the, the title that uh, Brenda introduced me with is, is the one I'm working with now, but actually my, my sort of uh, statement intent um, has changed quite a bit. So I'll, I'll just read you it just in case you can't see on the screen. Um, I'm actually reflecting on how wordy it is, but I think this is quite a common thing to revisit these things. Uh, so, it's, uh, so initially it was called analysis of the graphic language typographic articulation and identity within seaside resorts in the UK. This research inquiry will consider the role of graphic design, typography and visual communication in current and future regeneration strategies of coastal towns. It is a bit wordy. Anyway, I've revisited it now, so it's changed. Um, so I just thought it's quite, quite good to see the starting points of, of, of you know, the beginning of, of the PhD. Uh, as I said, uh, my, my, my origins, my, my origin of interest with, with uh, this subject comes from a very personal connected one uh, that, uh, you know, from a place that is ever changing in, in how, it, how it sort of promotes itself and, and the identity I, I find is really interesting um, from, because it can differ from the communities that live there to the to the people that visit, for example, their interpretation of place, and I think that's interchangeable as well. So I'm really interested in that. Uh, so um, really, what is concerning to me is the value of graphic design, and and how it's recognised or fully utilised in tourism strategy and placemaking schemes, and whether that's often the interpretation of place is is necessarily fair really um so my, my my research back began which feels like already quite a long time ago but as i said i'm only just sort of entered into my fifth year but it does feel feel quite a long time already but um, my research initially was looking at uh sort of the what i called sort of intended mo modes of graphic design and communication so where someone selected a typeface to be used or a design to be used based on sort of the, um, the, the, the familiar tropes within this, within this environment. And then those incidental um, graphic design instances uh, or, or artistic uh, instances, and they could be a torn poster, a fly poster, a, a graffiti, um, a faded sign, a ghost sign, a distress sign, you know, an eroded sign by the weather rusted. That sort of thing that again um, all plays a part in the environment uh, and what was quite good um, early on in my um, PhD is that as I started recording um, my findings and writing and documenting 
um, visually, really, visually and through written analysis. I, I did this, I've, I've continually done this at the same time. Um, the sketchbook is, is as much filled with written analysis and um, theory and observations as they are visual. Um, so I've been very, very keen to make sure that that relationship is um, a very intrinsic and uh, um, close re relationship really with that. Um, so um, I, I had a paper accepted um, quite early on in, in 19 um, for the Association of Heart, uh, for Art History Annual Conference in Brighton. Um, very lucky with the um, with the host destination there. Um, so uh, I was accepted uh, for the panel of art and gentrification in the changing neoliberal urban landscape. So I talked about that, those tensions between sort of found or distressed um, examples of graphic language in, in seaside resorts and those intended forms. And again, those, those tensions between sort of um, the value of those so where regeneration strategies in cities like Brighton, resorts like Brighton, have um, been met with resistance, you know, um, and I'll talk about that as I, as I move along. Um, so, so again, that was a really welcome and good opportunity to share my research to date. Uh, and what's really good about that is, as um, as Russ said in the in the last. Um, in the last session, um, where possible, if you do have the opportunity to, to share why your PhD progresses, I really recommend that because you're immediately getting feedback uh, and enabling um, external articulation of your work. Um, and I think that's incredibly useful. And also, you, you're, you're, by the very nature of doing that, you're, you're finding out um, new knowledge because you're working with others and you're, you're, you're getting, um, uh, you're, you're, you're receiving feedback um, on your work. Um, this is another example. Um, again, I was offered the chance to write a series for iMagazine, uh, the International Review of Graphic Design, I'm sure you're all aware of I, uh, and this was a series on the graphic language of the seaside. Um, so this is on, on I as we speak. So um, John asked me to write the series that would go on the blog. And uh, what was really useful for this is it is, is again the, the, um, the opportunity for, my, for, for myself to look at this at the research. So this was, this was 2020. Um, so just over, uh, so two years ago. Uh, and so this was this, this was a point of reflection of where I was with my research. And almost I, I, was, I was looking at this and thinking, well, if someone was going to ask me what I know so far about graphic design at the seaside, or what maybe I'm expected to know as maybe a perceived, um, maybe expert in the field, hopefully, ultimately, what, what do I think that they would want to know about typography, lettering and graphic design at the seaside? So I sort of broke, I broke up the series of articles, the structure, um, loosely around a day trip to the seaside. So it, it's, there's an introduction about typography at the seaside and graphic design. And then um, from article two onwards, it's about our journey to the seaside. So are we, are we there yet? Um, assesses uh, the wealth and depth of poster design for regional railways in getting us to the seaside from um, Around, you know, particularly around sort of you know 1920s when when the seaside was and 1930s when when the British seaside was in its pomp, um, the communication of you know posted design and advertising was crucial in 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 persuading holidaymakers to leave Leeds, Bradford, Glasgow, um, all of these cities and go to Blackpool or Morecambe or or those those connected resorts. That, um, that that cities would, um, would would empty through you know via those wakes weeks when those factory lockdowns and shutdowns um, and then escape to the to the seaside and all that offered. Uh, so then when we got to the seaside, Article Three would explore was exploring sort of the books of seaside revelation, so guidebooks, 
visitor guides. So looking at the design, um, looking at the typography, um, looking at um, how they were produced, who produced those. Um, and then uh, peer review, there's the odd pun along the way, you won't be surprised to see or hear, um, as it's the seaside. Uh, peer review would be looking at um, typography in the environment and looking at, so again, the patterns, uh, familiar words used, familiar typefaces, um, the histories, um, uh, the rooted origins of those. And then no assessment of the seaside would be complete without looking at the illuminations, looking at illuminated signs, um, how, what that, how, it, how it changes the context of the environment, um, how it alters our experience as soon as we walk down the, the promenade, um, how it alters and changes the perception of our sense of place. Um, which is which is really important, I think, for the for the coast. Also within this, I explore patterns and color schemes, which again are, are fundamental to the seaside. And then finally, before we all get back on that bus and, and go back to our cities, it's it's looking at the waves of um, popularity and regeneration, the uh, the the, re, um, the the resurfacing of of some of our major resorts in this country. Um, this is a snapshot of what that series looks like. As I said, so looking at those sort of key areas of um, the fundamentals to um, seaside graphic design. And these are, these are some uh, key, key aspects that I was looking at as well. So in, in looking at those key attributes of where I think graphic design has a fundamental impact on the identity and experience of the seaside, I started to then sort of dig deeper to, to where some of these uh, origins and um, references and influences have come from, um, so particularly typographically. And I'll talk about those as we, as we go on. So, so through the series, I started to realise that my research was, was now sort of, as, as predicted, and everybody says to you, your, your research becomes more focused and that, that, that begins to become um, uh, a much more of a, a sort of a thread of, of something that, that you really want to explore and investigate and sort of get to the bottom of, really. And, um, and this was lettering and typography um, and still the wider scope of graphic design but I was really interested in the, in the language and, 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 and really that, that conversation between the signage and the place and the people. Uh, that's, that's really important to me. Um, so, so looking at those, some of those communication platforms and how it works and really how, how, how the uh, promenade becomes a canvas for all of this. Uh, and how, how the seaside plays to some of those familiar sort of patterns of language and typography. And then in some cases, we're finding some disruption to that behavior. Uh, so, so this is the new sort of statement in, of intent and new sort of um, um, title, um, as, as, we've, um, as we said earlier. So it's, it feels a lot more focused while still able to encompass Things like posters, guides, advertising, it can still incorporate all, all, of, all of those additional key factors. Uh, so I hope everybody can see this okay um, with, and clearly. So again, as, as Russ and, and the other speakers within the first um, ISTD session uh, spoke really well about how it's important to map your research and where do you think it's going to sit and where's it going to be important um, and where you're going to look at. So these are the sort of areas that I, um, I feel that, and it's sort of in, uh, ever, ever evolving and interchangeable, if, uh, if I'm honest. Um, lots of things will swap columns or as you'll see, there's lots of repeated um, key factors in some of these. But really looking at the title, Letter and Typography of the Seaside, it's sort of framed either side and I'm not splitting them because I want them to be separated, but I feel that they wrap around the, the place as a concept and then the seaside as a specific uh, place 
of focus and how we sort of analyze uh, the design of place and the experience. So it's the impact, I think, collectively, all of these factors are really key to my research to start to sort of unpack what's behind some of the language and the meaning within the typography at the seaside. So also uh, uh, to look at that, I start, obviously it's absolutely key that I'm looking to who are the experts in the field, who has the knowledge in the field. So looking at practitioners, um, so such as Andy Altman and Gordon Young, um, you know, who have who've produced, you know, um, arguably the most archetypal and, and um, best example of some of typographic public art, certainly at the seaside and anywhere else really on this scale if we look at this and uh, what i really like about this is how engaging it can be for us you know we can walk on it we can read on it we can read it um we can interpret in different ways i really like the way that um the piece doesn't tell you who the words are from you have to engage and find out and work it out so i really like that and i think the um placement of it so directly um opposite the entertainment area, the main sort of promenade of Blackpool, um, where it's placed is absolutely key for this to be successful. And the conversations this instigates uh, and its relationship with the, um, with the environment around it, really, I think is key. Also looking at typographers, um, looking at typographers um, who, um, oversee foundries as well. So this is Paul Barnes and um, through a recommendation with Phil, um, I've um, met Paul on a number of occasions who's given me um, a lot of, uh, uh, very kind with his time um, and, and his knowledge of the history of many of the sort of categorized typefaces and areas of typography and history of typography that I'm looking to um, to make some connections between the seaside and the history of typography, particularly large display typography. Uh, and also from outside the field, I would really like to say that the importance of looking outside of the field is really, really useful and fundamental. So I'm really pleased to say that I'm currently um, working with Dr. David Jarrett from the University of Central Lancashire. Um, so more about that in a moment, but David's expertise is looking at seasideness and the sense of place at the seaside and particularly Morecambe. Uh, David is a lecturer, um, as I said, in tourism. Um, so again, um, coming back to that structure and really it, what I've done is, is sort of replaced sort of the idea of who I'm going to look at to become a literature and practice review and a community of practice. So within a literature and practice review, and I've talked with Pendo, I've got some book recommendations as we, we've gone along, and I will talk a little bit more about this uh, um, later as well. Uh, the literature and practice review. A again, it's, it's absolutely fundamental that anything I read or I write or I observe or work with any practitioners, um, that is seen as, as one review. So the idea that it's not a literature review and it's separate from practice, um, they're completely combined in, in underpinning um, any responses I do to the sea, you know, in response to the seaside. Uh, so some areas of exploration um, that I, I'm looking at and my approaches, so methodologies. Um, so a real range, I mean, fundamentally, every resort that I respond to, I'm obviously visiting and looking to be quite, you know, as absorbed with the place as much as possible. So. Um, it's visually responding, it's writing, it's documenting through photography, meeting people, interviews. Um, so it's it's very much a, a documentary, different ways of recording. Um, I think what the PhD has given me the opportunity uh, as an academic and in a, in a very busy role, we're all familiar with these things, um, is to re-engage with the sketchbook which I found um, just a fantastic opportunity again to do that, um, to, to engage with observational work, 
um, on site, um, where we're collage, um, are quite actually drawing there, really feeling the elements, um, you know, quite windswept and it can really affect the page. I quite like that. Some, some work, some don't. It's quite nice that it's quite hit and miss. It's, it's a bit like a day of a seaside sometimes. Um, and then respond using some of the materials from the seaside or some of the regeneration sort of concepts around this. So looking at things um, that we commonly see like packaging or OSB board that's, uh, that's um, um, used for regeneration, so boarding up things and, and you know. Um, so, so I'm really interested in, in, in this, this idea of the materiality as well as the seaside, you know, that, that sort of quite plastic, um, illuminated aesthetic that's completely part of it and changes the context of the language, I feel. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple of case studies. I'm conscious of time, so uh, um, and just to give you an idea. So I'm going to talk briefly about this one, but but largely about a recent exploration um, of sort of the origins of some of the key, uh, really the the key key sort of um, links to some of the, the 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 familiar seaside tropes that we see uh, along the promenade today. Um, so, so I'm going to come to that in a moment. This, this, this is a project I was asked to be part of and uh, successfully um, applied to be part of a, um, a collaborative exhibition in Bridlington. And the brief was really to respond to um, one of the concerns that they outlined. So uh, the, um, one of the options I looked at was climate change and environmental concerns. So I was looking at how typography and potentially installation work could respond to climate change or the erosion of the landscape. There's a real concern to the East Riding coast of uh, Yorkshire, where Bridlington is. Uh, so, so I sought to, to look at using something that's really familiar to the seaside as a vehicle for, the, for a typographic message. And I'm sure we've all been very familiar with um, ice lollies and the jokes that, that, that we often find once, once we've consumed the ice lolly. Um, so it was, it's basically a, a play that, that, that climate change and erosion is no joke. Um, and I really wanted to sort of accentuate this point by almost doing them, uh, produce them as, as quite a Klaus Oldenburg scale, sort of Vegas scale sign, if you like, um, which again connects to the seaside, really, this idea of this, this everything's ill proportioned and, and has that sort of false aesthetic really. Um, and, and, and literally position this on the beach to engage conversation. Um, we did exhibit inside as well, within an internal ex exhibition space at the exhibition center. Um, I, I, I didn't include pictures on here just because I was conscious of, of the time we've got available, but um, I didn't think that was as, as successful um, I really like that it's it's placed in context and, and I like the fact that it's open to the elements. The next key area that, that I would really like to uh, talk about this evening is uh, the main sort of focus of a, a recent exhibition in, in Margate at the Margate School, uh, which was a fantastic opportunity. And I'd like to thank everybody down at Margate again for, for this, who, uh, Tony is very familiar. Um, and the position of, of the school, um, I mean, yards away from the beach, the Turner Contemporary, um, it's on the high street. Its position was just absolutely perfect to, to hopefully engage conversations about the identity of place um, in Margate, but really it's about the British seaside. So in looking at the... Um, the language of, of the British seaside. What I was trying to do is, is map some patterns and look at um, the classifications of, of the typefaces and see whether there's any value attributed to those and are they seen as throwaway um, of, of lesser significance or have they been used in other contexts and, and were they designed for something else, um, which I'm, I'm interested in, the sort of duality really. So looking at some, some of the origins of some of the, the typefaces that we see along the shore, um, I was really interested to see some of the, uh, the history of some of the typefaces. So um, I visited um, lots of archives. So um, 
lots of these images are from um, the Ditchley Museum of Art and Craft um, in Sussex. Uh, also lots of online archives and again conversations, continual on conversations with, with Phil and Paul Barnes of, of assisted me in, in, in the roots to finding out some of the connections with, with, with some of the roots to, to um, look at the sources of some of these typefaces and trying to find out why they're being used really. I have to say that, that, that this isn't complete, you know, um, the idea that where I am as part of the PhD, this is still going on. And um, what I'm really enjoying at the moment is, is looking to document the patterns of usage um, at the moment, which, which, which is really, really interesting. Um, so I'm getting more and more specific uh, with the research. Okay, so, so this gives you an idea of some of the, the, the sites I was assessing. So we look at the seaside and we can look at places like Brighton and Margate, and we can see some of the oldest um, examples of um, the Tuscan, for example. So the above image is um, Brighton Pavilion, and that's one of the oldest um, examples of um, the Tuscan typeface in this country. So we can see there in, in Margate as well. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Tuscan as, as, as we move along. So to, to start to explore, really, I, I decided that I, I wanted to try and do a type specification of some of the most used typefaces I've observed to date and really produce it as a guide for anybody that wanted to make that connection or maybe select a typeface. So this is where I'm looking at for it to be a contribution to knowledge and have an impact on, on, on the design of the seaside. Um, I have to be honest, and also for my, for my journey, I, I sort of needed to, to do this. It was a necessity for me to understand uh, the relationship between these, key, these key classifications that really go back to the early 1800s and the, the, the foundries of, um, um, you know, those early foundries around that, around that stage. Um, so, so what's really key with this, you know, if we're going back to the early foundries of Fry and Thorn and Figgins, um, those, those early foundries that are looking at very ornamental faces, um, Roman type faces, fat faces, slab, Egyptian slabs, um, and then moving on to Tuscan type faces. So, so it's sort of a chronological journey, but without it being too fixed or, or uh, posited like that and positioned like that, really. I didn't want it to be too much of a, a history lesson. It's more about the typography and place that's important. Um, so although I, I do provide the reader um, with those historical references. Uh, so each layer gives you a reference point to the origin, but gives you the contemporary version of the typeface I've used. Um, so a word about the text, and as this was going to be exhibited in Margate, I could, couldn't resist really using um, T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, which um, part of it, as many of you will know, was written on the seafront at Margate. So I've used sort of a juxtaposition, a cut up version of that poem, um, to, to again, to, to map to the often fragmented, but when it, when it comes together, it, it becomes uh, much more of a formulated and complete picture of the seaside that we're all familiar with, but often it can, it can be a fragmented, um, interpretation, um, the, particularly by day, uh, the seaside. So, so I wanted to mirror that. So this journey takes us through this this poem and acts as a as a um, as a narrative for that. So as we can see, um, fat faces. Um, also, the materiality is important with this. Um, we we re, um, reused the isolated stick, but in a different context. So the idea of um, something gets taken forward, but also the print. So the print is, is um, uh, on, on a stock called Universal Light that's it's almost uh, material, sort of a, a blend between paper and material and a plastic. Um, and it just draped. And, and I thought that that mirrored um, the awnings and um, 
a lot of the sort of wind cheater material you would see at the seaside. So that was a consideration too. But coming back to some of those foundries was really important to me, looking at the history and the origins of Figgins's work in, in introducing these display typefaces that would be used for public notices, posters, public announcements. And in looking at that, I could make much more connections with why um, there is a strong usage of these typefaces, although they're used in an illuminated way, they're used for a very distinct purpose because of uh, um, how they can be used at a scale. So suddenly typography was used at this stage around the early 1800s um, in a bolder, um, uh, weightier sense and, and a lot of uppercase because for the very fact that it was typography to be noticed. And we see this in context in um, Margate at the, uh, <coughs> at the original site of the sea bathing hospital, um, so with the slab serif there. So these letter forms of emphasis. Uh, and this is where I sort of come back to, to that structure that I showed earlier. And, uh, and again, some books that, that I've, I've talked with Brenda and Tony about some of the recommendations. Um, so there's far too many to mention, and I did include, I, I'll be honest, far more, uh, but we'd probably be here till nine o'clock. Um, but there are key books that I use at key, key moments of time. Um, I think these were absolutely fundamental, these, these books, in, in, in referencing sort of the origins of the seaside, um, typography of the seaside, and, but also having a context of the classifications and, and finding out more about the typefaces that I then find. So that, that mapping was in, is incredibly important. Um, and also you'll notice that there's nothing there specific to the seaside. So it may look a bit strange, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking really at, at type and language and, and then mapping it back to the seaside. So this, this journey runs through and it's a series of um, type specimens, as I say, I must keep an eye on time, um, and takes us through this, this journey, um, through the narrative and explores these different categories and classifications and provides us with more background and how we could maybe use these typefaces in a different way, as I have here. Um, so sort of changing, hopefully, the original text, um, so maybe our interpretation of the T.S. Eliot text, but maybe also as we see the type in the landscape as well. So obviously those, the way I've used that type there is very different to pretty much the same typeface on the North Pier there. As said, um, one of the key considerations is um, the Tuscan typeface. Um, so in its varied form, um, this is being used um, right back from um, when Figgins introduced this in 1817. So we've seen this evolve over time in, in, in many different um, variations. Uh, and it really lends itself to the, to the seaside for many reasons, I think. It's, it's, it's decorative in form, but it also mirrors some of the shapes and the sort of carnivalesque of the seaside. If we, if we look at some of the shapes of these characters here, um, there's almost like a jester carnival quality of some of these shapes that I think is no accident and it's not incidental that, that, that this does map to the seaside. Um, following uh, the introduction of many of the typefaces here, um, lots of these um, Tuscan typefaces and in particular the chromatic Tuscan typeface were, were developed uh, by American type foundries and then brought back over here and then we use them for various forms as well but it's where uh, the Americans really developed this this idea of the chromatic and this is a bit of a detail of one of the prints and you can see how I've mapped sort of back to the origins and then outlined the modern um, typefaces so I'll, I'll, I'll flip through some of these so that we, we're, we're good for time but this brings us sort of right sort of up to more recent times and up to sans serif. But as you can see, um, we're looking at Playbill, we're looking at Windsor, um, Cooper Black. Um, so we're looking at a lot of Roman typefaces 
And when you see sort of the palette that, that we've drawn upon over the last 150 years in, in, in applying lettering and typography to the environment of the seaside, uh, it is varied, but there are distinct patterns. So I'd like to come to that just to finally to close. And, and really where I'm at at the moment is, is looking in more detail at the content and meaning and looking at methods of documenting graphic design typography in the environment and looking at other practitioners that have, that have done this. Um, so um, I'm looking in particular at Alison Barnes and Robert Harland. And um, Alison Barnes um, describes some of the mapping processes, um, graphical mapping processes that she's, she's looked at, sort of this sort of uh, hinterland between and, and combination of geography and graphic design. So sort of geographics. So looking at representation that maybe is different to a, an archetypal map or cartography. Uh, and also Robert Harland has talked um, at, um, and referenced uh, a lot in his book, Graphic Design in Urban Environments, about graphicity and graphicality. So the idea of graphic, graphic representation that again is outside and beyond a map, but, but how we represent and how graphic design is used by other disciplines, such as geography, the disciplines of geography and historians, for example, and architects and urban planners. So bringing us right up to date, and I'll close just about now. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really pleased to be working with Dr. David Jarrett, um, um, who um, we are writing, currently writing a paper called Character Building, Typography and the Centre Place at the English Seaside. Um, and this is to really determine how typography looks to create or contribute to that sense of place of the seaside. And in doing that, I'm looking at some of those methods that, that Robert and Alison have looked at and starting to look, look to map some of the frequencies of some of the classifications that are observed in the seaside. So looking at the case study of Scarborough, so I've started to look at different ways of mapping, some successful. So whilst this works visually, it doesn't work on a continual level because of the amount of documentation you would need within a document to do that. So looking to Alison's method of how you would might map a place, I'm looking at other methodologies to do that. So whereby there's, there's some sort of symbolism to map to the typographic classifications. So again, this is in progress and um, it's researched as absolute current. And so really what I'm looking to do is to look at how some of these strategies could really be useful to tourism, authorities, councils, designers, without being too um, didactic or um, you know, directive with this. And, and look at this being a resource as a, a reference point to have greater value of the role of graphic design in the environment. Um, I'm also working with a colleague on a commission for a Blackpool council um, for a resort called Anchor's Home, just north of Blackpool. And again, um, exploring graphic language in the environment within this project as well. Um, so that's where I'm going to end. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. There's so much, uh, so much there in, in that Thank presentation. You. Um, Sorry, I went a bit over. <laughs> no, no, not. It's fine. Not at all. Uh, but thank you for uh, your generosity in sharing the process, your process so openly and um, in such detail. And even that discussion, um, uh, we interchangeably use practice based and practice led research. So it's really good to have that really clear definition. And again, that the idea of dissemination throughout the research um, to, yes. so you're enabling that external yeah. articulation of the work and, and getting that feedback and new knowledge and, and further insight. And I loved the clarity of your questions for the iMagazine uh, article, the what do I know, what would, what would I be expected to know as an expert and what would it be useful for others? And you're talking to a very expert audience through iMagazine. So it's, it's, it's the clarity of those questions is really useful. I shall be stealing those, <laughs> uh, but, it, but it's really good. So um, 
if I, we have some questions coming in um, on, via the chat, um, and if anybody else has questions they wanted to put, uh, fire them in and maybe let us know who you are. Um, I, if I may, I had a question. I was, uh, I really was admiring your notebooks, the sketchbooks, and you know, part of the thing about the PhD is having to to really put aside the time to devote to it in a very disciplined way, and sometimes it almost seems a bit onerous that task, but working with the sketchbooks and gathering that critical commentary um, and reflection in the sketchbooks just seems like a really sort of pleasurable joyous thing to do as well as that really deep thinking and i could i ask you how did or how does that uh rehearsal um or, or thinking rehearsal of your ideas and your thinking and the theory how does that manifest say or how will it manifest in your final submission that writing that you do in the sketchbook will it be in the yeah, sketchbook? that's future? that's a really really good question brenda because um it's something i'm looking at now really of how how to um document that that journey because in in discussions with phil um and and, and lisa um at, at leeds um it's they they feel that it's it's an integral part yeah. of arriving uh, a, a pivotal point of the research journey. So it, it, it's 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 been that for for all of the work I've done, uh, really. You know, and I would say that both on an analytical approach, be it for I, uh, or the um, gentrification paper for the art history, or, or for for the Bridlington project or Margate, um, because at, at first, I, again, I'm going to be really honest. I sort of kept them separate. So I was I was doing a lot of writing on my laptop or on my iPad when I was out and about. And then a lot of my drawing in the sketchbook. But now I've looked to combine them both. And of course, a lot, a lot of the writing still happens on the laptop, but it gets it's extrapolated from those pages. And then and of, and of course, you know, the the typography um gets gets worked up from from the sketchbook. Uh, I've, 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 at the moment, I've started to copy stand and 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 document it in that way. But I've I've got to think of a, of a different way. Really, I would like to submit the books, but I'm slightly conscious I don't want to submit the skip load of you know <laughs> that sort of stuff but coming in. You know, yeah. you know with these big ice lolly sticks as well. You know. Yeah. Just be like loads of stuff. We'll have you but, back. Well, actually, that was our other thing that we discussed, <laughs> Justin, because we we talked, we often talk about how to begin a PhD and how do you get started. And um, but actually a lot of the time the difficulty is in how do you finish it? Yes. So um I don't know if you had any advice uh or or <laughs> you know, even in terms of your own experience, what would be the one thing you'd or is there a key piece of advice you'd have for anyone looking to finish a PhD or find a way to well, yeah, uh, well, I suppose I'm right um, in the, oh, do, do you want me to stop sharing? Am I still sharing now? I don't think so. No, don't think I'm, no, that's good. Uh, so that's good. Uh, so finishing, yes. Um, maybe I'll come back in here and half and talk about that. Yeah, you can tell um, that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah I, I suppose at the moment, the discussions are around uh, not trying, uh, it might sound strange, but not trying to do too much on an external so for me uh my director of study and phil they they've been discussing with me that the external dissemination in, in in my respect is i've probably got quite a lot at the moment so it's how i'm going to now articulate it so i'm now looking at vehicles to then make this knowledge useful for others so i'm looking at um a website resource so whereby you'll be able to look at some of the examples within the seaside environment within these case studies and then that will map to some of the origins or some contemporary typefaces okay. um so that's that's how i'm looking to 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 complete yeah okay thank you um i have a question here from david wren cardiff metropolitan university um, and he has asked, he's a couple of kind of wider context questions, actually. He has said, based on your research, what are your opinions on the relatively recent rebrand of Dreamland Margate? Is it, does it align with, or is it empathetic to your current research findings? Are you familiar with that? I don't know. I, I am, I am indeed. <laughs> Hello, David. I, I hope you're well. 
I, I, I've uh, met Dave uh, several times before, part of the Graphic Design Educators Network. Um, yeah. The rebound of of Margaret. Yes, no, I do think it's, I do think it's uh, uh, sympathetic. The reason I think uh, that it is, because what I like, what I like about uh, the the rebrand is, is actually it's it's not a singular form of communication. Actually, and what what the, what they've what they've looked to do is they sort of take you through phases when you go to dreamland so that with that idea of that the, there should be something for every generation so there's something in there from the 40s 50s 60s 70s and 80s so it's so i think they, their plan was that their, their intention is that you're going to be able to connect with something with the graphic language and the yeah. mood of that you know so even if you just want to sit down and relax or go roller skating there's going to be you know that idea and um, so I think it's got a very different feel for many other attractions, I think, okay. in the UK for that for that reason. And the, the way that they, they, they organise it as well, I think, is different. OK. And then in terms of that wider context, um, he has a second question. Are there any commonalities between British seaside vernacular and other European countries or further afield that you've come across in the course? Yes. Of yeah. So. Um, so uh, well, there, there are commonalities, but then there'll be different slants and flourishes, you know, within within different European um, resorts. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar, for example, um, with um, French resorts in Normandy. Uh, so, so my wife's French. We go to we go to France a lot, and and looking at that uh, seaside vernacular, uh, th there will be. A lot of typefaces there, there will be a lot more decorative but but then quite industrial as well because of the landscape as well because it's, it's quite a, a, a brutalist lands, landscape in some respects la Havre, for example yeah uh, being a port uh so so it does have these quite um um abrupt <laughs> juxtapositions between something that's quite French in its in its look, and then, then it'll be quite brutal. Uh, so there are some common typefaces for that, um, and and of course then then when we look to 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 the states uh, for their usage of a lot of the wooden um, block typefaces, a lot of the uh, chromatics, which we we use, I think, which are interchangeable. We we see that. So and I think we've we've seen really that that graphic language of Coney Island and Las Vegas and. Yeah. And, and that's coming to our seaside culture. Yes. Yeah. That sounds like an amazing conference that you have to organize. Yeah. <laughs> we can all just go and revel in those nice. visuals. Yeah. Nice. Um, we have a question in from, I think it's Maya. Um, we, she, uh, Maya says, amazing presentation, exclamation point. Did you make any discoveries that took you by surprise? Surprise. Yeah. I, I suppose it's the um, things that I've been taken by surprise is how different i suppose the um concentration of um the seaside and how it's designed so i, I think in our mind in our mind that we think it's quite uniform in in the in the structure the architectural and urban plan of a seaside resort but in in working with david and looking at the case studies that we're looking at at the moment we're doing a lot of comparisons and we're looking at how we can compare resorts and actually it's been uh, you know it's looking at those um uh, patterns between how a resort has a continual promenade so i've really got into i've really got interested in in urban planning far more than i thought i'd ever get interested in um and, and architecture which is fantastic so i'm really really fascinated by this now so so i suppose the surprise is is, is just how different they are and then and then the differences on how some resorts that i'm finding are using more or less typefaces and i'm right in the midst of that at the moment so so you will have more usage of the tuscan the tuscan seems to be the most flamboyant and commonly used one say on on, on, a, on a promenade and then a roman typeface will be used to really get the the impact so cooper black or windsor um Will, will be used to for ultimate impact. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, 
I want, uh, I have a question in uh, Jill Spratt from University of Ulster has asked about your research methodology. So you um, shared a really clear diagram where you were mapping sure. uh, the territory. Sure, back up, yeah. Yeah, sure, that'd yeah. be great. And um, Jill is asking about research methodologies um, and how you defined those. And um, maybe you could speak a little bit to like you, you. I was wondering myself about interviews and you were talking about case studies and, and uh, you're talking about, you know, I suppose what these places mean to people. And um, so how did you or what what methodologies did you use or how did you? Yeah, uh, no, very no, large area. How did you? No, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it's interesting because we're, we're we're looking at framing um, the methodology at the moment for this paper. And and uh, I didn't mention in, in the talk, but the paper that I'm writing with David, we're hoping that it's going to be, um, we're going to be sub uh, submitting, we've already found feedback um, for a publication called The Annals of Tourism. So I'm hoping that that um, this is successful in the sense that I'm against, um, hopefully, disseminating outside of the discipline of graphic design, which, which hopefully would be useful to those that are looking for further context on, on the visual language of the seaside. Yeah. So I think the methodology we, really when in, in the case studies, they're, they're seen as uh, illustrative case studies uh, and, and looking at uh, methods of ethnography, empirical case studies, um, and, and looking at, at that as a, as a documentative process, really. Um, in that methodology of, of, of looking at that. It's, it's obviously a, um, looking at a qualitative one rather than you know, looking at quantitative data. So it's, it's, it's assessing um, and, and mapping the different landscapes. As I say, what we, some of, some of the uh, problems um, that we found is that you haven't got that fixed um, mass of space there isn't that demarcation of space that's fixed um, of that landscape the geography is never the same so you you have to um, create a boundary within each of those empirical um, case studies for for the documentation yeah yeah and and um even things like generational memory and you know what these things mean to kind of a younger generation and, you know, think they would have associations from growing up or things that they had never actually seen firsthand, but associate with, uh, with older generations. Yes, who's... yes, ab absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So it's, um, I think uh, more recently, I've been looking at the methodologies of um, cultural geographers. Okay. Um, so I've been looking at, at, at those methods to, to feed in. So as, as I mentioned earlier with, with Alison Barnes, I mean, obviously, as as a graphic designer, but but look looking at how how case studies and methodologies in in those fields of, of geography or tourism science could apply to the way that we are looking to assess the frequency of typography and language. Okay, thank you. I have a I have a question here um, from Brian um, who's coming in from the chat. Brian says, are there subcategories of typography within seaside resorts? Uh, do ice cream vans use particular typographic styles, arcades or fish and chip shops, etc.? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the very good question. So yeah. I'm, I'm just establishing this in, at the minute, minute, actually, and it's something I'm discussing with Phil, and it's actually so I'm going to be discussing be with him next time, <laughs> next time I see him, yeah, is that um, looking at the categories and, and within the slide where I showed Scarborough with the, with the dots sort of graphic, um, uh, to, to use Alison's the sort of geographic uh, approach, yeah. to then map to those classifications. So I, I've used the... Um, the, the classification references and research I've done is, is based on Catherine Dixon's research mm. and, and Phil's research into um, the origins and uh, of these classifications and looking at how um, they've mapped over time. So I've not used of all, all of Catherine's identified categories of typography, but I, I've, I've used, um, so I've used Roman fat faces Tuscans, Egyptian slabs, Clarendon and Ionic, 
antique and sans serif. Now, to answer the question, would there be subcategories? It's really, um, I'm looking at how I could maybe subcategorize um, the classification of the Tuscans typefaces to be looking at the chromatics um, and how they split into American, um, European, and then British versions of that, because that's a really expanded feel, field. And I actually think there's not as much written. I don't think there's, there's, there's extensive um, research that, that's been published, sort of, um, you know, just have, and then the relation to space on, on that category. So, so that would be, um, that would be where I'd subcategorize. And, and in establishing this, that's what I'm looking to hopefully do is to, to um, obviously produce and, and publish uh, the, the, the categories of the most used typefaces, but I'm, I'm not gonna say that you must, you must use these, but I'm just sort of as a reference point, these are the most frequently used. Um, yeah, and, and actually kind of a follow on, but from somebody else uh, who hasn't given their name, we have a question, why are slab serifs so popular in seaside typography? I don't know if that's a question you can- <laughs> I, th I think it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's the emphasis I, I think it's it's the weight and the emphasis and and in and in lots of occasions I think instances I think it's um, related to the architecture. So where we see that uh, that example I showed uh, in Margate and uh, there's 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 uh, quite a few examples in, in Brighton as well, but in Margate it, it is linked to to the material uh, if it's cut into stone. Um, but it's very much the impact and emphasis and meaning of the typefaces. And that's where we, where we have seen actually um, quite a lot of use of, of um, the fat face as well in, in those areas as well. So, so I, I, th I think that's right. I think, you know, the, the, the common, that's why I've sort of picked from um, Catherine's um, extensive, it's an amazing research body of work to explore those categories, be looking at those, but um, that's, I think, you know, it, as Jock Kinnear said, it, it really is the letter of emphasis, the slab serif. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, I, I have, a, we, I'm aware we've had you speaking for a long, long time. Oh, fine, I'm um, aware that I've probably talked too much. To <laughs> no, not at all. But I have a question. Um, Barry Tullett from University of Lincoln um, has asked, what is the single most important piece of advice you would give somebody who wants to, to start a PhD? Uh, I, I think ensure that the subject is going to hold your interest. Yeah. And um, in, ensure that, that there is something for you to um, argue with and probe and takes you out of your comfort zone. So what I really like about this subject is I have to go to the place. Yeah. Um, and that's not near. So it's, it's, it really forces me out of the comfort zone. And, uh, you know, we, we, we go to the coast, whatever the weather, myself and my, my poor family with me, and we go in all weathers. Um, we recently went to Scarborough and uh, it started off really nice weather. And by the end of the weekend, we had rain, snow and everything. And it was beautiful, stunning, but it was great. So, uh, so I think it makes sure that, that you, it sustains your interest. Uh, you, you you start to establish uh, a network that, that you think, you, you know, you're going to learn. Um, I think um, the, the, the most rewarding aspect of the research, I've, I've obviously enjoyed creating the work and, and learning, but it's, it's the network that I've managed to, um, you know, work with others. That has been hugely beneficial, you know, working with experts in tourism, um, you know, um, uh, Paul Barnes is um, uh, uh, very kind time, you know, uh, as an expert in his field and, and obviously working with Phil and, and Andy Altman, Gordon Young. Um, so it's, it's, you know, to name a few. Yeah. So it's really rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've one time, I've one uh, little question <laughs> that somebody has got in under the wire, no if that's okay. Uh, Stephen has asked, um, did you explore links between the typography of the seaside and that of things like steam fairs and fun fairs inland? Yes, yes, I have. 
Uh, and uh, um, that's a really good question because I've been looking at the, uh, it, it, I, I was, again, did, uh, uh, I was going to put it in the presentation, but we'll be there forever. So, so uh, uh, some tangential links, I think, that are really important to this research are the research of fairgrounds, circuses, uh, and looking at uh, also Victorian arcades in cities. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we have a beautiful one, the uh, Victoria Quarter in Leeds. Mm. Uh, and again, they um, uh, with that building uses um, uh, Roman type uh, typefaces, but particularly beautiful um, uh, yeah. Tuscan typefaces. Uh, so, so that that's really key. Also, just uh, again, another tangential link and one I've discussed at length with Phil is the influence and the importance of the Festival of Britain. Oh, of course. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think we've come to the end of our audience questions. Um, and just, uh, I think you've been, you've shared so much with us visually and in terms of, you know, what, what you've spoken about. And we all have the links to your I um, articles. And this talk will be available for anybody who wants to watch it back. And uh, um, I, I, for one, will be. Uh, rushing to do so. Um, it's been really interesting and really helpful. Um, Justin Burns, thank you very much for, uh, very much. for joining us this evening. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.